architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello everyone, this is Vikram Prakash and you are yet once again listening to Architecture Talk. Each episode we try and have a conversation with a contemporary thinker on issues of architecture and architectural thinking. Today I'm speaking with my friend and colleague Tyler Sprague, who has just finished a book published with the University of Washington Press called Sculpture on a Grand Scale, uh, which is a discussion of the life and career of Jack Christensen and his thin shell structures. We not only discuss the life and work of this remarkable structural engineer, but we also talk about the larger question of structural architecture, its past, present, and future. I hope you enjoy it. Here we go. Welcome to Architecture Talk, Tyler. Yes, thank you. I'm excited to be here. Uh, so congratulations on this fantastic book. Yes, thank you. It's called Sculpture on a Grand Scale, Jack Christensen's Thin Shell Modernism, which has been published by the University of Washington Press, who, as usual, have done a beautiful job of creating a very attractive book. It's, uh, you know, 250-odd pages, highly illustrated. Mm-hmm. Right. And I understand it's the first uh, major monograph on the work of this amazing structural engineer uh, who uh, you know, made Seattle into his base. Absolutely. So you are a structural engineer? Mm-hmm. Initially a structural engineer by training. By training? Yes, and then I've drifted over into the wonderful world of architectural history and modernism and really embraced the... Uh, the overlaps between the professions of architecture and engineering, which have always been a fuzzy boundary for me. It's always been very difficult for me to separate the two as creative practices. And so someone like Jack Christensen, who has a degree in actually architectural engineering, was certainly a great excuse to bring out so many themes I've seen. But but clarify this for me. What's wrong with you? Most structural engineers are, are, you know, regular nerds and they, you know, love their numbers and they want to solve complex problems. Right. What are you doing hanging out in history? (laughs) Which is great and important, but I think often (laughs) structural engineers don't get their due in the public eye Mm -hmm. because they are so typically not very good at communicating what they do and showing their impacts that they have on on the built environment. And there's always been greater stories embedded in engineers as people, as contributors, as citizens, that simply gets washed away in the, in the mess of numbers and, and things like that. And they tend to be very, fairly humble in their, professional, um, in their professional lives, often deferring to the architect as the one who brings the, the crea- all the creativity and vision to a project. Well, but I there's think, clearly yeah. you know, others that are contributing, and I felt got needed to have their due. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, it's not only about telling due. Well, a couple of things. I mean, first of all, you know, now there are people like Calatrava. Uh-huh. There have sure. always been people like Nervi, uh, you know, mm-hmm. Saarinen. Talk a lot about a lot of these uh, references and influences in your book. Sure. On the work of Jack Christensen. Uh, so, uh, and Arab's partnership, of course, with uh, people like OMA has transformed very significantly. Right. The kind of era of structural engineering as mm-hmm. simply doing the calculations for the architect's work. Now, how did you decide to become a historian? I mean, what was it in you that, you know, did structural engineering first? Was that to keep your parents happy and then you actually wanted to be a historian? What is the story here? Sure. <laughs> oh, I was all, yeah, always good at math growing up. So that was a natural path and never, never any barriers there. And I would So tell that was a problem. Just because you were good at math, they made you a structural engineer? And I would tell people in high school, I'm going to go into engineering and their eyes would light up and the and that was sort of the, the entry into, into a world there. Yeah. And then as I got further and further into it, I started seeing much broader views of the world that yeah, I yeah. 
needed to take part in. I took a very formative uh, study abroad to Siena, Italy when I was an undergrad. Oh. Did away with engineering for a semester uh -huh. and was surrounded by a medieval city. Mm -hmm. And you know, Siena has that tall tower that course, stands right course. in the middle. Yeah. And to think that that pure masonry structure has been standing since the beginning of time is not only an architectural issue, but it's a, a structural issue as one. So, yeah. so you cannot think about one without the other. Uh, yeah. And I thought there's a bigger connection here that I'm getting in my engineering curriculum. So that planted the idea. Yeah, yeah. I messed around with some uh, thoughts about historic preservation and getting into the reuse of buildings and mm. engaging that way. But really I was interested in the bigger historical stories and pulling those out and, All right. and writing about them. So yeah. yet once again, foreign studies does the trick. <laughs> So I think we, we, we need that, and I think uh, that's an important thing. Uh, uh, so, this, uh, so you're talking in this book about the career of Jack Christensen, and uh, you have described his life and career in, uh, in a fa you know, uh, uh, one of the interesting things about how you have written about it from my perspective is exactly this, which is that you uh, present him as a fascinating uh, kind of human being. Mm -hmm. You know, this guy who likes to with his wife, cry, climb Mount Rainier many times, Mount Hood, and uh, he's up there on Mount Hood when Mount St. Helens is blowing up, <laughs> and you have those pictures in here. This has nothing to do with structural engineering, right, but, right. but you have four pictures in color <laughs> about <laughs> Mount St. Helens. <laughs> blowing up in the background, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? He was the principal at a, at a major firm at the time. Yeah. It took him three days to get out of there, no <laughs> communication. <laughs> You know, to be that cut off for that amount of time is a big part of who he was. So, so, so introduce us to Jack Christensen. We'll talk to about him as a structural engineer in a minute. Sure, sure. But introduce to us to him as the human being that you discover. Sure. So he was born. He's a fascinating character. Yeah. Born in the born in the Midwest, right around the time of the Great Depression, mm -hmm. uh, 1927. Was not severely personally impacted by any sort of the depression. His father had a stable job as a dairy technologist. Dairy technologist. Which is about the most Midwest job <laughs> I can think of. Uh, born in Chicago, grew up in Oak Park. Huh? Riding his bikes around the famous houses of Frank Lloyd Wright, oh, passing them by, having Wright very, strikes again. <laughs> very little idea as to the complexity of the art, but sort of being surrounded by it. Uh -huh. He uh, was an avid reader as a young boy, just de absolutely devoured every book that he could get his hands on. Avid reader of novels? or Lots of novels. Like and his, who were his favorite his authors? His favorite book was Lost Horizon by James Hilton, okay. about the war veteran who goes and discovers the lost mountain city of Shangri-La. Ah, a romance, a, a romance sort of a discovery, discovery of utopia, utopia. Yeah, a utopian ideal that you know you can go and there's a whole grand world waiting out there for you uh -huh. that you simply need to go and find. I see. And he was somewhat, and he said, somewhat bored with his life in the Midwest, okay. too flat. <laughs> you know, the the vacations you take are too. You know, yeah, uh, the fair. not very <laughs> adventurous. And so he always said he wanted a life of adventure. Adventure. A life of adventure. So he uh, didn't know what he wanted to do, thought he was going into the military. And then right before he goes to enlist, World War II ends, and he makes a snap decision to go to the University of Illinois. Yeah. He doesn't know what he wants to study. He takes a high school exit exam yeah. where you fill in the bubbles and yeah, it comes yeah, yeah. back architectural engineering. Really? And he says, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> and just so happens, the University of Illinois has one of the best programs in the country as to this fusion between two historically separated disciplines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he finds his path there. Uh, he was also somewhat of a so childhood artist. everything is owed to the bubble, uh, to this computer <laughs> bubble sheet. <laughs> Maybe sometimes those things work. <laughs> Maybe right? sometimes. Okay. All right. I'll, I should have done that. <laughs> okay. Go yeah, on. He was also a, a childhood artist. He was surrounded by art and yeah. would paint and draw. And so he found an outlet for that within his within his degree program. He his first two years was taking studios and drawing in a pure architectural curriculum. Uh -huh. And then only in the second two years did he dive into the math and the calculations and the physics right. that goes into buildings. Uh -huh. um, he was active with both 
societies of civil engineering and the AIA yeah. and saw this path opening for him. He decided to get a further master's degree in structural engineering from Northwestern uh -huh. and went to work in downtown Chicago after that. Yeah, okay. He was one of the first structural engineers in the office of Perkins and Will. Okay, what year was that? That would have been 1950, 1951. So after the war, yeah. After the war. Uh -huh. Uh, but ultimately, he just grew restless in the mis Midwest. He but Chicago's the was a big town. Those oh days. yeah, uh, he's never been <sighs> interested in urban life. Doesn't Not interested like the in city. cities. Uh, he's so uh, still a Midwest boy in some ways. He's still yeah <laughs> interested in getting out <laughs> but, and yeah. well he he wanted mountains. Mountains. Yeah, that was what were, he wanted. Uh, that was his adventure, Shangri La. Yeah. yeah. And so he and his wife decided in 1952 just to drop everything and move to Seattle. He had seen it in life. But magazines. Seattle wasn't the big town in 52. No, no, it was it was the pioneer frontier. It was where you could go and you could climb mountains and carve out a little. I mean, Smith quaint Tower life was the big structure even then. Smith Tower was there. The Alaskan Way Viaduct was just up. Yeah. And it was a rather sleepy town. And as we know, you know, after the Great Depression in both wars, nothing had been built in Seattle really since the 1920s, late 20s. Right, right. right. And so he arrived mm -hmm. and moved to Bainbridge Island yeah. where he could live close to the mountains. Yeah. And then just had to go So get didn't a job. really settle in Seattle, he settled in Bainbridge settled right in away. Settled in Bainbridge right away. Yeah, and he had some family connections. It's a bit of a recluse is what I'm getting about it. He, he likes his distance from the city. Yeah. yeah. He, he's a bit of an individual in that in that way. Yeah. 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 And he'd always been fascinated with thin shell work, though. That also started at University of Illinois. Saw the work of Pierre Luigi Nervi, saw the work of Robert Maillard, and knew and saw something special there that connected to him. Thin right. shell was big in the 1950s. So I remember so my father also being into thin shell. Mm -hmm. And there was a thing, uh, there was a sense in the 1950s that through, through, through design and through thin shell, we would be able to, you know, do amazing things. Yeah. Isn't exactly. that true? It is true. Is that and true it's in general in structural it's history? A, it's a particular look at efficiency, yeah. right? efficiency of cost, efficiency of material. But I think there was also some sort of embedded challenge within it. What's the m absolute minimum we can do to get away with this? Right? Yes, What's the yes. absolute smallest amount of material we can use to span these incredible spaces? Right? So, 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 so for two minutes, challenge. what is thin shells magic? Tell us, <laughs> to us non-structural engineers. Sure. So most buildings yeah. use columns and beams. So there's a vertical column comes straight out of the ground and a beam spans over top, gives you a flat. Or arches. Or yeah. arches, other things like that, yeah. which is a fairly straightforward way, very simple way to build. And the beam is in bending, right? Mm -hmm. So it actually wants to bend down. The top is in compression, the bottom is in tension. With right. shells, we have a totally different way of carrying the load in a building. Yeah. So it's a membrane-like behavior. Uh -huh. Like bubbles. Like bubbles, yeah. like eggshells, yeah. like other things that have use their curvature, they use their surface geometry to distribute loads around a space. So more organic in some sense. So the structure has to be absolutely goes hand in hand with the space it's created. The yeah. shape of the structure mirrors the shape of the space yeah. and it's a much tighter integration of architecture and structure. It's an embrace of the building as a physical object in the world. Yeah. You have to understand how loads are going to the ground and make that a part of the design process. Yeah. Uh, it's not simply an afterthought or anything like that. So it's, it's a couple of things happening all at once. And it was an incredibly popular technique throughout the world, right? So one of the things I'm hoping to do with this book is connect. What do you mean throughout the world? You know, when did thin shell structures become big? So they, they sort of started on the, in, the, in Europe in around the 20s yeah. with the early concrete work done in, done in Germany where they could do a lot of the analytical work. Mm -hmm. But they really took off after World War II. Right. Uh, and some of that was sort of the thin aesthetic, possibly from airplanes and other sort of highly engineered things being more publicly so visible. So they were sort of part of the you know, post-war utopianism. 
Yeah, I would I would say so. Uh, the Highly sense expressive of new forms, optimism right. globally, and also technological. So by following structure as a way to shape your buildings, and, and is and, and are all thin shell structures necessarily uh, non rectilinear or curved? So uh, part of shell behavior requires that that curvature of material. If something gets too flat, then it goes into bending and starts to be like a beam. So once flat again. and beams are like bad ways of building. <laughs> They're highly inefficient. So the amount of material you need to build a beam-like structure yeah. is much more than you would need for a shell. But this is good to know because you know we've all obviously got it wrong all along, <laughs> right? Right? I mean, all this, the tyranny of the right <laughs> angle, you know, your domino doesn't make any sense, does it? Old Corb's going to be unhappy about this. In but he got into some thin shell stuff. Yeah, he absolutely, he yeah. did. He em embraced many curved structures, including the hyperboloid towers in Chandigarh and yes, all sorts of other things. And the yeah. Z Zanakis the designed, Zanakis, uh, yeah. Of course. So he was getting into the thin shell stuff. Getting into right? there. Yeah, yeah, in the and 50s. It, it has to be a, a structural logic that you follow that takes you there. Because right. they're often much more difficult to build. Yeah. If you don't know what you're doing, they will, they're, your cost will be astronomical. Uh, so they have to take a particular perspective on what buildings. What do you mean, I, uh, if you don't know what you're doing, the cost will be astronomical? <laughs> so one of the things that made Christensen so successful yeah. is he figured out how to reuse formwork within mm. his buildings. Because the cost of building the wooden scaffolding to hold the wet concrete in place while it cures mm. is immense. There's a lot of work, a lot of carpentry work that goes into making that formwork. Mm. You have to not only support the concrete, you have to actually shape the shell mm. based on that wooden formwork. Mm. Uh, and so his early projects were a single form to form a single shell. So if you think of the Green Lake Pool, okay. still exists as his very first shell, uh -huh. a single shell. Uh -huh. He found that about 50 to 60 percent of the entire cost of the project yeah. was just building the, the wooden formwork. scaffolding that yeah. was essentially thrown away uh -huh. after the project was done. Mm. So that is a violation of his philosophy. That is not something that aligns not with his efficient. approach. Not efficient, <laughs> right? So his next project, which was the Seattle School Warehouse, yeah. is a repetition of, um, of uh, about 12 vaults in a row, all cast from a single formwork. Mm. He figured out if he could build the formwork, put it on rollers and lifts, he could simply sequence the construction of the building I and see. cast multiple shells from a single form. Right, right, right. And he has a huge cost efficiency then. I see, I see, I see. So he sort of cost code the whole construction right, system. Right, right. Uh, and you can compare that to other globally significant shells like Eero Sarnin's uh, shell at the MIT campus, yeah, the yeah. Kresge Auditorium, yes, yes. which was absolutely instrumental in sort of sparking this global wave of interest in shells. Yeah, yeah. And yet it was horribly expensive to build. Oh, really? A single scaffolding and formwork was placed underneath. Right. The proportioning of the shell was not particularly matched to the flow of structural forces. So Sarnin designed it as only a sort of a physical geometry, mm -hmm. as an eighth of a sphere coming down onto small points. Uh -huh. Uh, but the geometry did not support the way loads flowed, so they actually had to thicken the shell quite a bit at the supports. Oh. And as time went on, they had to prop up the edges with steel posts. Oh no, so I hope nobody from MIT is listening. <laughs> <laughs> they know well about the issues with, uh, with the Kresge Auditorium. <laughs> But I it's an example of sparking the interest in thin shells while mm. not quite right. understanding the, the structural and construction um, so it was a global rage in the 50s. You know, everybody <laughs> was doing it. It seemed to Absolutely. have a lot of promise. And here's Christensen out in Bainbridge working in Seattle, uh, you know, optimizing it further through, you know, efficiencies in the construction system. Mm -hmm. so, 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 so let's just jump a little bit ahead. Why, why, did, uh, why did all this die out if it did? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a significant decline in the 70s and 80s mm -hmm. in the interest in thin shells. And I think it comes from two fronts. Yeah. Uh, on one side, for the engineering community, there were other techniques that were becoming available to do efficient structures. So lots of cable net structures, mm -hmm. lots of fabric structures, even inflatable structures. We see an emphasis more on pure lightweight structures. So think of Fry Auto mm. starting to take off yeah. and inspire that imagination, inspire that architectural um, 
sort of spirit of the 70s and 80s is far more about thin stretched cables rather than shit curved concrete shells. I see. So cables, you, I intention mm -hmm. somehow are they what? Are they're just sexier, or they're <laughs> more efficient, or cheaper? In some ways, they what? are. They are also an efficient way to cover space. So doing a cable, a cable hung structure is also a a, in a structurally efficient way to cover space. It has its own requirements of supports and. Um, things you need to um, do to design an actual space supported by cables, but that's what Fry Auto was figuring out. And so that, I think, took off as sort of the next wave of interest in structural efficiency and mm -hmm. technological... And then where did that go? Or how does the line descend down from auto? Uh, so I think that sort of continues on into the world of, say, someone like Peter Rice at Arup, who does things like Center Pompidou, and it gets more complicated as we go out from there, rather than sort of a pure, almost modernist look at singular materials or singular approaches. Yeah. There's a much more, much more multiplicity within structural engineering from that way forward. And Calatrava is which lineage? Uh, so he is... Uh, uh, similar to Christensen with his blending of architecture and structural engineering. Uh -huh. um, he owes a lot to Felix Candela, who was an another thin shell concrete yes, designer in Mexico. Oh, amazing. So in some ways it's, it's the same wave, it's just passing through different materials, passing through different people. It's that it's similar ethos of finding efficiency and a sort of an expressive language from structure that continues through Okay. And others. So let's let's come back to Christensen. So he, sure. he arrives in Seattle and he's located in Bainbridge, and he you know is upset about uh, the efficiencies of formwork and he improves on those, and uh, 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 and then his practice takes off from here in Seattle. Mm -hmm. So you you describe him in your book repeatedly as a particularly northwest modernist. So what what, what is your claim there? So I think there is something to the, the spirit of the Northwest at the time that he draws from in his designs. I don't think it's right to think he's simply someone bringing ideas from the Midwest to Seattle and watching them Oh, this grow. is a global, thin shell is a global. Sure, yeah, sure, yeah, sure, yeah. sort of as a global. I mean, there's Candela, there's, uh, you know, all the stuff. Yeah. I'm thinking my dad in India is doing 1950s mm -hmm. thin shell. Cobb's doing, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, it's coming from all places. Yeah, and yeah. then the way he, so for one, he works always in tandem with architects. He is never the prime designer on the buildings he works with. So he's working with Paul Kirk, he's working with Fred Bassetti mm -hmm. to design thin shell structures with these architects. Mm -hmm. He often takes the lead in suggesting thin shells as a strategy, mm -hmm. but it's in tandem with those architects that they actually bring the buildings to life, that they shape different proportions, that they do those sorts of other things that bring the building to life. So he's collaborating with Northwest Architects. I also think there's something in his approach that could possibly relate to his ambitions of mountain climbing. And his idea is that out here in the Northwest, things are possible that weren't possible in, in the Midwest or other places in the country. You can climb a 14,000 foot peak on the weekend, mm. and you can try to extend the scale of these structures to, some, to a, a dimension larger than Candela ever tried. There's sort of a, I don't know if you want to say a frontier spirit or a pioneering, a pioneering idea that was seemingly embedded in Seattle at the time. You have Boeing doing you know, incredible things with the airplane at the time, and mm -hmm. sort of this sort of, of course, the 1962 World's Fair is also a big, big moment in his career. Yeah. In his career, and he has a big part in shaping the aesthetic of But that before fair. we go to that, you know, did he work with Boeing, or did he have some active connection? So he was in a, a structural engineering firm that had mm. several partners that had worked for Boeing beforehand. I see. He designed several airplane hangars for Boeing, including the, the B-52 hangars out in Moses Lake. I see. Are made out of thin shell concrete. So uh -huh. he's certainly surrounded by Boeing engineers. Uh -huh. as, as time moved forward, Christensen also was one of the first to bring computer-aided design into the engineering office. And that owed a lot to some of the computer uh, calculations they were doing at Boeing. 
and it was really bringing some of the finite element analysis. We are talking about 60s or 70s? And this is into the 60s and the 70s yeah, okay, now. Yeah, right? okay. So he makes, the, he embraces that as part of his practice. Christensen really So do you have a sense that, you know, although there were these people who had been at Boeing, was there a, a back and forth with Boeing engineers uh, or not? So he certainly was working with people that had worked with Boeing, but I didn't find specific evidence that he had an uh, active conversation okay, with okay. them on, on the design all of right, these things. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, the two things that I want to sort of delve deeper into. First, let's talk about the Seattle World Fair. And then, of course, we're going to try and spend some time on the kingdom, which mm -hmm. is his sort of, uh, you describe it, in here as his uh, masterwork, <laughs> which is particularly interesting to me. But first, let's look at the World's Fair, 1962. And this is certainly Seattle uh, trying to be, uh, you know, grand. Mm -hmm. Position itself as a space age city. Yes, right? space age city. So is that a particularly northwesty ambition at that time? What, what, how are you describing it in terms of Christensen's career and his designs uh, uh, down at Seattle Center. Yeah. So I think the fair gave him the excuse to work on buildings that uh, he wouldn't normally have the chance to work on. So mm -hmm. a fair building is tip is has a limited window of when it's supposed to be experienced as part of the fair. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of a celebratory aspect to it. Mm -hmm. And I think with that nature, he was able to take a little bit of liberties with his designs he might not have done otherwise. Be a little more sort of expressive and outlandish with his work that he wouldn't have done Grand otherwise. scale, that's your phrase, is it? But <laughs> <laughs> or that's his phrase. That that's his phrase, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sculpture on a grand right. scale. And it, you know, as he worked at the fair, he's always working in tandem with architects. So I'm always hesitant to sort of promote him as a as an active creative individual because he always deferred to architects. Oh. He always said, oh, I'm just following the architect's vision. Mm. I'm always you know, in line with what the, the project is. But really underneath that is a layer of artistic creativity and ambition of his that I've had to extract. Right? Or was there a greater sense of partnership with architects at that time or at least in these projects? What's your, what's your sense of that? Yeah, so that it was developing. I mean, I do think that another thing that was unique about the Northwest here yeah. was that architects were open to working with structural engineers. And as, as his career progressed, he got to that point where he was valued as a collaborator, brought on as a creative an individual, not simply providing a service to the architect, but actually well, Did he have somebody in particular that he worked in more collaboratively with? So he worked very closely with Minoru Yamasaki on uh -huh. several projects. Yes, yes. Starting yes. with this world's with the U.S. Science Pavilion of the World's Fair, mm -hmm. lives on today as the Pacific Science Center. Right, right. And that's a fascinating story of a back and forth between Yak Yamasaki and Christensen, because uh -huh. Yamasaki has these ambitions to use technology, but in a to create sensitive human environments. Mm. So when he was given the commission for the project at the US Science Center, he did not want to create a singular building. Mm -hmm. He wanted to create a complex with a singular courtyard. Mm -hmm. So it was the experience of being in that courtyard surrounded by his buildings that was the primary, his primary design goal. And he did that through absolutely meticulous detailing of the facades, if you will, of the buildings that faced the courtyard. Right. This white quartz, precast concrete that's absolute has a, a thinness mm -hmm. that Yamasaki was never able to get on any project beforehand. Uh -huh. So the thinness of his lines, of the ribs, and the detailing of those walls is due entirely to Christensen. I see. And even the towers that stand over the entry platforms. Yeah. Yamasaki had designed similar towers before, but never achieved that absolute thinness in concrete yeah. that Christensen was able to give him. I mean, there's sort of a gothic quality, isn't there? In sort some of gothic ways, yes. Cathedral quality. So some describe them as a, a space age gothic uh -huh, <laughs> uh -huh. approach. Yeah. Yeah. And Yamasaki was interested in technology. He was interested in the role that structure could play in his designs. Mm -hmm. and that project really launched a close partnership between Yamasaki and Christensen and John Skilling. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It really was an alignment of, 
of ambitions and building that took off starting with that. Uh, so which project. are the projects that Christensen worked with Minoru Yamasaki on? So he worked on uh, a series of thin shell vaults at Carleton College that cover the gymnasium and auditorium. Mm -hmm. There was a, uh, a church in Glencoe, Illinois, that's mm -hmm. similar to some of his um, sort of hyperbolic paraboloid umbrella roofs here in the Northwest, but it's designed as a, as a sacred space. Mm -hmm. So there's um, some differences there. He designed a, a, later in his career, Christensen did embrace some cable technology. So he, he actually has a, a cable net roof that he designed for a synagogue with Yamasaki. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are several other smaller projects that he did. Okay. And of course, the skilling firm goes on to design the World Trade the Center World towers Trade. in New York City with, with Yamasaki as right, well. Right, 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 right. Uh, so uh, let's now turn to the kingdom. And uh, what I want to begin with is, you know, uh, is uh, I was there for its mm -hmm. uh, implosion. Uh huh. In the uh, spectacle. Yeah, in 98? No, uh, 2000. No, 2000, 2000, mm -hmm. in 2000. <coughs> and it was quite a spectacle. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were up there on the hill and first hill, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, once it imploded, the dust cloud sort of expanded out mm -hmm. and rushed towards us in a way that seemed, wow, that was quite something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I do remember uh, feeling, uh, you know, ambivalent about the whole thing. I remember mm. feeling uh, that, you know, I'm not talking from a sustainability perspective, which of course is important, you know, why, why destroy mm -hmm. structures, but simply the, such, the public spectacle of imploding mm -hmm. grand, what I would call brutalism. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, was uh, was was disconcerting, and I read in your book that you know obviously Christensen who designed and made it, uh, this was obviously uh, it, it, he he took it to heart, did he not? Mm -hmm. Yes, it was absolutely uh, incredibly personal. He took it very personally. Yeah, the the demolition. Uh, he saw the the kingdom as a fabulous multi use space owned by the public mm -hmm. as a resource for everyone in King County. Mm -hmm. And even though he saw the changing nature of professional sports and the rising um, sort of economies of that with luxury boxes and, and those sorts of things, which he decried as well, he still saw immense use for the building as a sort of a, as a utility and he was absolutely devastated when it came down. Yeah. He refused to, you know, talk on the phone. Mm -hmm. uh, put down the phone. You described right. the scene. Can you describe the scene for us? Uh, of the of the demolition or the uh, phone call? Phone call. Yeah. So uh, he was at his home in in Bainbridge Island, mm -hmm. and the the demolition company. Uh, heard that he was the designer and they asked some of his advice on mm. where to place some of the explosive charges. Where could they most where easily they asked him. bring it down, yeah. right? Where, where were the weak spots that yeah. they could, you know, place charges to bring it down? And he politely told them that he had no interest in discussing with them and probably had a few other choice words for them, <laughs> slammed down the phone. Uh -huh. He later told me that he had a dream that they tried to blow it up and that they couldn't. Really? Which was, his, he was holding out hope that yeah. the kingdom would resist these charges and continue standing. Mm -hmm. And of course he lobbied hard against his demolition. He yeah, wrote yeah, letters to Edder, all those sorts of things. And when it came time for the actual demolition day, they, they also offered him a front row seat. They mm -hmm. said, oh, would you like to come watch the demolition with us? And he rejected that, got very angry and left town, went on a, a hiking trip. Um, in the mountains and wanted to have nothing to do with it. I mean, this is a story I hear many times. You know, there are several buildings, famous buildings in uh, India that have just recently been demolished. Mm -hmm. For instance, the Hall of Nations by Raj Rabal, sure. just been imploded and sort of the uh, emotional trauma, right. the kind of association that architects and engineers sort of the sense of Mm -hmm. emotional investment they had Absolutely. in their structures. Yeah. 
And I remember, you know, my father's uh, big work was the Tagore Theater, mm -hmm. which was also, it wasn't imploded, but it was effectively destroyed. Yeah. And the emotional impact that had on him, and I think in some ways ultimately really killed him. Mm. I mean, he was, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. he was uh, 85 years old. Yeah. Um, so right. this uh, this is a very specific thing that I think uh, belonged to that generation of designers. Sure. Do you not think this kind of emotional investment? Absolutely, it's, you know, and, and, and which is more than you know, uh, you know, the utility of the structure. Right. He often backed up his his claims with saying, "Oh, it's still useful. It's still good. Don't throw it away." Yeah. But ultimately, he, I think he loved that act of creation. He loved the act of building, visualizing something, and seeing it manifested in the in the physical world. And actually, the quote that the book draws its title from is, you know, he has this quote about how being an engineer is so wonderful because you can you're like a you're like a sculptor you're creating sculpture on a grand scale but being an engineer is so fun because what you build is in the real world you can walk around it you can kick it you can hit it with your hand it's a mm. physical part of the world that you are also a part of right and so there's sort of a, a body analogy to that he saw these as as living creations in a way living buildings i mean they were the the manifestations of his create of all his creativity and he saw them you know as these active parts of of the world he thought the kingdom would last a thousand years what does he mean did he actually use the phrase thousand years yes he actually uses used that phrase he said that he designed thought he designed the build, building to last a thousand years like the pyramids uh, he uh, when he was building it he visualized like the it gothic cathedrals like also. gothic cathedrals those are a sure. thousand years old right on average like the the roman Colosseum, he mentioned maybe two thousand years you know he saw so it. he saw himself as competing with the roman Colosseum, the gothic cathedral the egyptian pyramids he saw he would love to travel internationally as no, well no, as no, not just mountains. traveling but uh, you know that was the that was the sort of uh, the driver behind a lot of his ambition to see to it come down then in what what was it 25 years how mm -hmm. long did it live about 25 years yeah, a Therefore, under then years. is uh, is a huge emotional blow. Big blow. If you think right. you are building for a thousand years, it comes down in twenty five. That's uh, almost requires a shift of worldview. I mean, that's a total, you know, violation of what you thought the world you was about, doing, or yeah. what you were doing, or what this is. So, so what was it about the kingdom? Tell us about Christensen's uh, investment in kingdom. Like, sure. what was it? Well, it was a very long project. Of course, mm. the Forward Thrust funded the multi-purpose stadium, and from the beginning, it was meant to be a weatherproof dome, okay. right, where they could play sports, have exhibits, concerts out of out of uh, out of the rain. And the project went through many cycles. Mm. Initially, it was designed for Seattle Center, and Christensen produced these amazing designs for a Seattle Center Stadium. Where Key Arena is or where was it supposed to be? Uh, so it was sort of where Gates Foundation is now. Uh, okay. Sided to that side. Uh -huh. uh, ultimately that site was rejected by the voters based on circulation and traffic and other things. Uh -huh. The project goes into question. They're searching for a new site. Uh -huh. Big controversy where the stadium should be. In the meantime, we have the oil crisis, rising price of fuel, yeah. rampant inflation, yeah. and the county is absolutely bound to the budget that was approved by the voters. I see. And so th there was a, a good chance the kingdom might not have happened at all. Uh -huh. uh, but Christensen, designed a stripped down structure. So with people like Bob Souter at MBBJ, yeah. they took away everything that was So extraneous. who was the architect of the kingdom? Was there so an architect? There was a partnership that they called Naramore Skilling Prager. Okay. That was the lead design team. Mm -hmm. So it was a combination of NBBJ, mm -hmm. Naramore and then Skilling from Skilling, Helly, Christensen, Robertson. Right. And then Emil Prager was a New York engineer who had mm -hmm. also worked on the Houston Astrodome. Mm -hmm. They brought him in as sort of a proof that a local firm could pull it off, but by all accounts, he did not have anything to do with the design. Mm -hmm. um, so the, it was the architects at NBBJ. Bob Souter was the one of the primary designers there mm -hmm. alongside Christensen. Mm -hmm. But the kingdom itself was absolutely stripped down. Mm -hmm. Everything was meant, every structural element was meant to do at least two things, 
So the columns are U-shaped, so they double as mechanical chases mm -hmm. for systems going up and down the building. The ramps that circle outside mm -hmm. are also part of the earthquake lateral resisting system. Mm -hmm. And there's all sorts of other efficiencies they got to just try to get to a basic uh, lowest possible cost, dollars so, so, cost. So, so it was a, a difficult time structure. It was mm -hmm. a sort of a, it's a stripped down and made efficient, not just for structural reasons, but also because it had to conform to a time of austerity. Yeah, absolutely. austerity is the word right. I'm looking for. Yeah. Yes, very, ab absolutely, yeah. It reflects that what was the part of the era. So the original budget was 40 million, mm -hmm. 10 million for site, 30 million for the building. So all the way through, they are trying to maintain this 30 million dollar cost. In the 70s. In the 70s, yeah. right, which gets absolutely difficult to do. Christensen designs this rotating formwork system, so the yeah. 40 wedges of the dome can yeah. be poured on only four pieces of formwork. Yeah. Right. And as they, as they go through it, there's trouble that comes up during construction with the contractor who uh -huh. blamed Christensen for a faulty system, uh -huh. but really the contractor just wanted off the job because he was losing money uh, left and right. Yeah. He had underbid the project and he wanted a way out and he <laughs> figured a better way to leave would be to claim something, walk off mm. and sue rather than finish the job. I see. So the county ultimately brought in somebody else to finish the project. They finished it no problem uh -huh. on a slightly different cost basis and the uh -huh. kingdom was finished for $60 million dollars in 1976. I see, I see. And part of that austerity is honestly what cost the kingdom its lifespan. So one of the issues with thin shell concrete in the 50s and 60s is they thought the shell could do everything not just structure, uh -huh. but they thought a thin shell of concrete could be insulation, they thought it could be an acoustical layer, uh -huh. and they thought it was could be waterproof. I see. And those three things were really what the problems with the kingdom were based on. Right. To the day they demolished it, there was nothing structurally wrong with it, but there were other operational issues that were coming up that made it difficult to occupy. So what, what three, how were the three problems manifested? So by a faulty waterproofing layer on the roof was mm -hmm. improperly installed so water leaked through mm -hmm. and when that happened it started staining some of the acoustical panels that were essentially just stuck to the inside of the of the dome. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a point when some panels fell from the ceiling and these are large six foot by six foot panels falling mm -hmm. hundreds of feet to the floor okay. so a public hazard. Uh, those when that happened, the kingdom had to be closed for for renovation right. um, at at taxpayer cost. And right, so, right. if you ever hear anybody mention the the debt that the state that the kingdom owed, it was basically due to that that renovation. I see. I project see. that went through. The acoustic tiles fell. Waterproofing wasn't perfect. Any other problems? Um, so there's, you know, it was a, a single multi-purpose use stadium. So the other complaint you hear is, oh, it wasn't tailored to, since it housed everything, it wasn't specific to anything, mm. right? So going to see a football game was great, but you could have been closer. Going to see a baseball game was okay, but some of the sight lines weren't on. They also held basketball games in there, if mm. you could imagine, trying to shrink a large arena down mm. to a small basketball size court was was difficult. They had a wonderful operational crew that was great at flipping the use of the kingdom essentially overnight from mm -hmm. all these things together. But ultimately that did not align with the changing demands of sports fans. Uh, they also had concerts. I know Led Zeppelin in 1977 uh -huh. played there. <laughs> Yeah, the know, Rolling Stones <laughs> played there, yeah. right? This was the major venue for Seattle. Yes. When the kingdom was completed, it brought the Seahawks, it brought the Mariners, it was the venue for major entertainment shows. In some ways, it put Seattle in a cultural sphere that it had not been before, a cultural sports sphere. And we're still living in a post-kingdom era, right? We take those things for granted now yeah. that Seattle's a location for those things, but they would never have been here in the first place without the kingdom to bring them here. The other thing I've heard people say, and I, you know, I have opinions on this, that it was, uh, you know, not good looking. Uh -huh. <laughs> that it was uh, sort of looked like a just sure. a structural, you know, concrete 
pile. Mm -hmm. And some of the, you know, the reviews from it when it was completed are fascinating. The sports broadcaster Royal Brom mm -hmm. has a, a quote saying, he thinks it's absolutely perfect for Seattle. It's a stripped down stadium for the lumberjack city that we are. Yes, right? yes. It's that, you know, we don't need those frills. Yes. This is Seattle, uh, right? Yeah. It's like Nirvana and in their plaid shirts. Exactly. It's like, you know, we don't do that kind of right. shit. We don't need anything like <laughs> that. And of course, there's stories I've heard that they were supposed to paint it and they never painted. They were supposed to clean it regularly and they never did. One of the complaints of Christensen's wife was the city took and took from the kingdom and they never gave anything back to it. Mm. it yeah, no, but well, that's a maintenance issue. But even when it was freshly and newly built, I'm very, it's mm -hmm. fascinating to think of its aesthetic as belonging to the Seattle spirit, which is not yeah. that of, uh, of, of, the, the of, of the World's Fair. Absolutely. It's more of the grunge. It's, it's kind of, one can think of this as early Seattle grunge architecture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's fascinating. I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. You didn't put that in the book, though. Did not, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a, yeah, very good take on, on grunge architecture. Right. Grunge architecture. Yeah, right. Under the large, expansive roof. Oh. At the time, that was sort of the idea that if in Seattle, if you could just get out of the rain, you could welcome everything in. And it was a publicly owned, publicly funded stadium that was supposed to to do that. It was for the people. Yeah. Right? I mean, sort of the new aesthetic of stadiums is just this kind of postmodern stuff, you know, with the yeah. boxes, which mm -hmm. tries to harken back to the days of the, I don't know, sort of 19th century Coliseum-ish look. Right. Uh, right. Uh, <clears throat> so that's a fascinating uh, thing uh, about that. That would definitely describe this as a northwesty. Mm -hmm. uh, structure if one wanted to see it right. that way, which is very right. different from how we architecturally describe the Northwest aesthetic as about, you know, wood mm -hmm. construction, joinery, and sort of right. very different aesthetic. Mm -hmm. And the, the aesthetic of Christensen's shells shifts with the times. I mean, this is a, absolutely a product of the of the 70s and not similar, more similar to his work from the, the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of what I tried to get at with this idea of a thin shell. Modernism is, it is a part of his design approach that's not a rigid you know, way to build, but simply a medium through which he can express all sorts of ideas of the time or the place. If you think of comparing Christensen's work to the work of Candela in Mexico mm -hmm. or, or others in Japan, mm -hmm. you can see a great deal of variation within the approach to thin shell as a part of modern architecture. Uh, so, as we draw towards the end over here, uh, so uh, do you see any future for Thin Shell? It's interesting to sort of see the, see the waves of it. So it certainly fell from favor in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. And then I would say it's almost on the upswing now. There's really? a new interest in material efficiency mm -hmm. aided by digital technologies. Mm -hmm. There's a new interest in uh, minimizing the carbon that is embodied carbon of a building and mm -hmm. if so if you're looking for an efficient use of material from a structural standpoint you can't get much better than shells mm -hmm. so they are utilizing different materials so mm -hmm. sometimes it's a compressed earth brick mm -hmm. sometimes it's actually a wood shell but so I think there's a there's a future for shells that will mm. rely on some of this earlier work, but get taken into new material and, and spatial dimensions. Like that Uruguayan architect. Uh, Eladio Dieste. Eladio Dieste. Is mm -hmm. that thin shell? It's a, it's a shell of concrete with brick. So it's a sort of a hybrid system. Uh -huh. And he's able to get much more flowy geometries than he it's would out of a single thing. Gorgeous work. Absolutely work. gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. Right. That, that, that sort of work owes more to sort of the era of Candela and the older work than what's coming forward. But uh -huh. it's, uh, there's many, many potential frontiers for, for shells today, I think. Mm -hmm. It's a low carbon uh, uh, footprint uh, Right, way of so if you actually start adding up how much material is needed to build a building out of columns and beams and slabs, mm. and then you compare that to how you might enclose that space with a shell, a shell will always win. 
uh, the challenge these days is to actually, how do you actually take advantage of that shell behavior while shaping a, a usable building, right? How do you actually get flat floors that people need to walk on rather than the, the domes of, of curved shells? But that's where a lot of interesting research lies mm. in how to take that and integrate that into contemporary building methods. Gaudi's uh, Sagrada Familia, uh -huh. is that uh, connected to this in any way? Um, he certainly was a, an early, someone who very early on looked to a structural logic mm -hmm. to derive architectural forms. Mm -hmm. So one of the most famous things from Gaudi is his hanging chain yeah, yeah. models yeah, that yeah. he simply inverts right. to form a, a cathedral. Yeah. And that was his using the logic of a tension only structure is mm. the exact opposite of a compression, compression only. only structure. Yeah. And that's a, a type, uh, another way to get efficiency from material. Mm -hmm. And some shells are compression only shells. Mm -hmm. uh, Christensen's work actually has shells that work in both tension and compression. Mm. So compression only shells can be built just out of stacked stones. Yeah. Very little mortar, very little jointing in between them. Mm -hmm. Christensen's shell need a layer of reinforcing to give these shells some stiff some resistance to tension as well as compression so it's similar sort of getting efficiency from from material slightly different uh, use of it though Tyler it has been a pleasure to have you on the it's podcast. been wonderful always wonderful to chat with you Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. This is Vikram Prakash, your host, and our producer is the one and only Sammy Prouty, a graduate student of architecture here at the University of Washington in Seattle. I hope you all enjoyed our conversation, and if you did, please do take a moment to subscribe and to rate us on iTunes. See you next time. Take care. Goodbye.